So why data visualization, right? Um, it communicates data clearly, uh, doesn't have language barriers, right? And effectively with pictures, graphs, and um, charts. And anything to help people to understand the significance of the data. Um, especially if you are a data scientist, it, the quickest way to get people to understand what you glean from data is through data visualization. And to enable decision makers to see analytics, to allow people to grasp the difficult concepts, to identify new patterns from visualization, and actually see what patterns are there rather than just going through all the numbers, right? And to find insights in the presentation and outcome of the data analytics. Okay, so uh, very quickly, the, I'll spend the next uh, 10 minutes going through the different um, data visualization uh, charts and graphs out there. Okay, so that's a dot plot. Bar charts uh, could be vertical, could be horizontal, right? And the floating chart or called GAN charts, um, if anybody is a project manager, they'll be <laughs> used to these sort of charts. Uh, pixelated bar charts. So each of these is an individual person, you can see. Blue for male, pink for female. And a histogram. Slope graph, where the slope actually determines uh, how different the, the range is of the numbers. The radial charts. Leaf charts. This one is um, pretty cute. <laughs> a Sankey diagram. See, the um, thickness of the lines also tells a story. And this is the area size chart. Join Facebook. Okay, um, small multiples. No trellis chart. It's a word cloud. You're familiar with. Pie charts. Square pie, tree maps, circle packing diagrams, bubble hierarchies, tree hierarchy, line charts. We are inside somewhere here. The red one. Spark lines, area chart. Difference with um, line chart, area chart is area chart, you will need to start with a zero so that you can see the area. And there's a stack area chart. Horizon chart. Stream graph. Uh, for stream graph, basically there is no positive or negative and you actually only concentrate on the, the area. Candlestick charts. Barcode charts. Flow maps. Scatter plot matrix. Um, for data scientists would be familiar with scatter plots, but basically you just plot every single data point in to find the clusters. Heat maps. Parallel sets. Radial networks. Network diagrams. Dashboards. Maps. Crawl path maps. Dot plot maps, bubble plot maps, topological maps, particle flow maps. This basically shows the the wind over time. Uh, cartograms. Basically, this is indicating the population size. The bigger it is, the larger the population. Dolan cartogram, similar population size, but using circles. Network connection map. This is, I believe, um, Virgin and Singapore Airlines. Spatial temporal cube. So you have your map, you have your timeline, and then you have your cities. Animated maps. You 3D maps. Virtual realities, and that's roughly it. Okay, so all the different types of tools you can use, um, the different types of charts, graphs you can use to visualize your data. You know, pick any one of it that is pretty, that actually conveys your idea um, in the right manner. Okay, and you can do amazing things with them. Okay, thank you.
Il me semble que tu pourrais faire. So I'm really excited to be here today sharing a topic I'm passionate about, which is data visualization. So can I have a show of hands? Who among you already work in data field? Very cool. And who use R or Tableau? Nice. Um, so let's get started. In this session, we'll cover the basics of visualization and visual storytelling. before uh, moving to our hands-on session, which will be fun. Uh, so once you receive a data set, there's a few things you can do. One thing is you can look at the summary statistics, but they never show you the whole picture. In this example, every frame of the animation is a data set, and they all have the same mean, standard deviation, and correlation. But when you plot them out on x, y axis, they're distinctly different. So the kind of chart we make will depend on the kind of data we have. There's three main data types. One is quantitative, one is ordinal, and one is nominal. Quantitative are like numerical data, for example, uh, your age. Um, and ordinal are categories where they have some order. For example, um, the food you had just now, is it good or bad? Uh, so they're not all equal. They have some sort of ordering. Then categorical are categories, but without order. So for example, like countries, or your job, or your industry. And then there are also three uh, data types that are a bit special. One is network. So network data comes with like nodes and ages. For example, your uh, friendship on Facebook, uh, your connections on LinkedIn, or the actors and actresses who star in the same films. There's also special uh, spatial data, uh, the kind of data that you would want to, to plot on a map. There's also time series, for example, temperature this month, rainfall this month. So those are also kind of special data. And also, the usage of color in visualization was never random. Uh, there are three major color palettes. One is sequential, often used to show quantitative data. Uh, so the night color uh, show a small number, use the dark color to show a big number. And then diversion palette, which is very suitable to show ordinal data, which we've just seen that ranges from bad to good. So you can use different color tone to designate that. And there's also a quantitative uh, color palette that doesn't have some sort of ordering or importance among them, which is suitable for categorical data. So just now you have seen like dozens of chart types. Some are very complex, some are relatively simple. All of these, uh, all, most of the chart types are made of three primitive geometry. that are lines, dots, and areas. And then there's dozens of visual encoding that you can leverage to show different data attributes. For example, you can vary the length of the bar, the color of the dots, the shape of the point, and all of this could help you to visualize multi-dimensional data. Uh, but one thing to bear in mind is not all visual encodings are perceived equally. For example, humans perceive length far more accurately than area or even color. So the kind of chart we use, um, as we said, depends on the data we have. It also depends on the question we want to pose. So when you look at a big data set, sometimes it has multiple relationship or patterns within this data set. Um, for example, if you want to show comparison for discrete or continuous data, you probably want to use a bar chart or line chart. If you want to see correlation, um, scattered, plot, scattered point or bubble chart is suitable for this purpose, and you can even um, like a fetal regression line there. Uh, for those special data types, such as network or hierarchies, you can use some sort of our tree structure or network uh, chart to show that. There's this tool I want to um, point out. So uh, it's called visual vocabulary. Um, you can select, for example, you, um, you want to visualize the distribution. And it will give you some uh, recommendation, also some use case. For example, I select the distribution here, and it show, it's showing us we can use histogram, box plot, um, um, population metrics, or dot plot, all kinds of uh, options, depends on your need. And in terms of chart choices, there's often more than one options. And it really depends on 
your unique perspective and what you want to show. So in this example, uh, the blogger for flowing data, which is a visualization blog, uh, visualize the same data set in 25 different ways. And this data set is life expectancy by country from year 2000 to 2015. So on the chart on the left, he basically just um, dump all the countries as a night chart, um, put everything in one big spaghetti. And uh, so the chart on the left, on the right, he employs a technique uh, which is small multiple and basically and arrange the countries alphabetically. So in this case, you can easily zoom in to a country of interest to see how their life expectancy vary across line, uh, vary across the years. So both charts have some pros and cons. You may find the one on the right a bit more readable. Um, so Data visualization is often a process of exploring, understanding your needs, and also iterating to find what's best what's best for you to communicate your point and what's best for your stakeholders to drive your point through. And just now we have seen multiple examples of static charts, so we can move on to uh, some animated charts. So one of the data visualization guru called uh, Stephen Few said numbers have an important story to tell. So oftentimes it depends on us to uh, make them speak, turn them to, into life, and give them a convincing voice. And next I'm going to show you two examples I find interesting. And I'm going to tear them apart to see what kind of techniques they use. Maybe we can use as well. So this is a story about death caused by US gun violence. Uh, each arc is an individual. The author annotated his name, the age he was killed, the age he could have lived on to. And then on the top right uh, and top left corner, uh, they showed big aggregate numbers. Um, total number of people killed, total number of stolen years from their life. So what's wonderful about this, uh, one technique they use is comparison. Is comparing the years these people lived with the years this person, these people could have lived. It also used a combination of detail and aggregates. So you can see like individuals in the arc diagram. You can also see big number aggregates. So you have a uh, both side of story. Another thing um, the author did very masterfully here is a color. Instead of choosing some random color, uh, he used a high contrast black and white, which is befitting to the topic. And he also kind of speed up the process. At first, it was very slow. It kind of uh, keep you, make you slowly um, getting used to the topic, digesting what's going on. And then and the graphics start to speed up, which brings you to the animated humanized story about the uh, catastrophe caused by gun violence. The next example is relatively simple, but also interesting. This is more in a category of data visualization for fun. So the visualizer asked a question here, what if I compare Olympic swimmer with some ocean animals to see who can swim faster? So basically, he um, put like Olympic swimmers together with some fishes and stuff. And instead of just showing a boring bar chart, he actually made it very intuitive. You can actually see who swims faster. And you can also input your own speed. So it kind of uh, allows you to participate in this visualization, which makes it an interactive experience. And so that's uh, the two stories I shared. Um, in your day-to-day -day life, that's, um, there's sometimes if you work with data, there could be a visualization you want to make. Or if you are on the consuming end, uh, you can use some of the techniques we mentioned to kind of detect visual lines or um, kind of critique how other people's visualization to see what makes sense for you. Are you getting the value out of this visualization? So um, any questions so far? Okay. We can take a short break before going on to Tableau and our demo. Uh, so in this session, we are going to run through some Tableau stuff. Uh, you don't have to hands on. We can hands on in the R session, because Tableau, there's some licensing restriction, I guess. Uh, so in this session, we can work through to create <coughs> a simple dashboard like this. And it's 
you will see it's really easy to do something like that. And so a brief overview of Tableau is a explorative, analytical, and also a presentation tool that enables easy interactivity. Uh, so let me briefly walk you through its like functions. Um, it has a data pane, so you have like measures which are like a categorical variables, and um, you have like dimensions which are like categorical and ordinal variables, measures which are like quantitative variables. You have like a area here which is something like a pivot table. You can drag and drop stuff on the rows and columns, and then. Very simple, you have a show me. Once you have data there, you, when you click show me, it gives you like multiple charting options. So the sample data we use is a superstore. It shows like purchases and profitability of stuff like furniture and stuff. <coughs> uh, so uh, one thing we can do is we can open our slide. We can open a view to create our chart like the Top, top half of this, which is profit, profit ratio, and sales by region. And how we are going to do that is we can search for the field you want to uh, use using this search pane, and then you just drag it here. Similarly, you can search for the field you want to, uh, the quantitative field you want to show, just drag it to the colon here. It's really simple. And then you want to do something else, which is profit ratio. Again, drag it here. So it's really fast and simple to do something like this. And the next half, uh, we want to do our map, which is fairly easy to do in Tableau. In this one, we are visualizing profit ratio by different kind of state and postcode in the US. We drag it here. We can search for the state. It, give, it automatically gives you some sort of recommendation, but you can change it using Show Me. <coughs> right now, we will be using offline map for the network. And then here is where visual encoding comes into play. So all these are visual encodings. For example, you can drag field onto the size to vary the size of the bubble. You can drag field to the color to vary the color of it as well. For example, we can drag cells to the size. <coughs> All right. And then you can like generally scale everything bigger or smaller. Sounds OK. And then maybe you want to add a little bit of translucency to make it look fuller. And we can drag profit ratio to the color to make the profitable and non-profitable show different color. So we have very high level of granularity with state. Let's see we, if we can go one step lower. If we have region. <coughs> Adding cities. Uh, so by now it is showing sales by cities, colored by profitability. And right now we have made two simple charts in very short amount of time. And when we can name it, for example, this is sales versus profit. This one is a map. And then we can put both charts on our dashboard. So we can start a new dashboard here. And again, basically drag it here, drag it. Through. We can change the size of width and height to make it fit nicely into one screen. And then we can add some title. So that is really, really simple. 
and I'm sure all of us can do this. Uh, we can use one chart to filter another chart as well. For example, here we click South and it's highlighting all the states and cities in the South. So that's a basically a very simple Tableau walkthrough. And at the end, you can save the file. Basically, you want to save it if you, um, there are several options. If you save it as TWBX, you will package the data within your workbook. So when you share it with other people, they can open it. If you save it only as TWB, actually you will detach the data and other people may have difficulty open it. So rule of thumb is generally save as TWBX. Any questions on Tableau? Oh yes, that's a very good question. And uh, so growth percentage, uh, you can look up the table calculation. Uh, you can, in order to have growth, you need to have a date. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So instead of region, let's say it was uh, this time. Right. Uh, you can try it on your own. Basically, it's very easy. You put date on the uh, y-axis, and then you can try out the right-click it, use table calculation, and then you will give you an option like months and months, year on year growth, and you can do that. Uh, I will here. I will demo the usage of label here. Uh, so this is a field you can add labels. The difference between label and tooltip is tooltip is something you will only show when you mouse over and it will pop up, whereas label is something that is just um, here. So as I drag uh, the label of this small uh, panel, which is uh, about which is about profit here in the label pane, uh, label button you, is showing the profit of by region. Or oh, similarly, I can add in profit ratio here. Also sales. And then you can also format your label. Like you can change their color. You can change their unit. In sometimes with a nice array, you can only you can choose only the min and max instead of every data point, which makes the chart a bit cleaner. And you can suppose you have like a map with tons of data points, you can use allow neighbors to overlap other max or unselect it to kind of automatically hide some label to avoid like cluttering the data in the chart. Uh, sure. Uh, in this case. Um, Let's say I, this is the button to duplicate. So in this case, let's do stack bar only on one measure, which makes sense. Um, if I can put state as a stack. It seems to be too many states, but you get the idea. Basically, when you put some measure onto the color, you'll slice by that measure. Uh, I think it's because some state has negative profit, which means this is not a great example. Let's say instead of profit, let's just show the count of it. So in this case, you will start from zero, which basically um, there's a number of um, cells or whatever, a number of records in this state in this region. Suppose we have, uh, like right now we are using the aggregations, yeah. some aggregate or move, which is available. Yeah. If you want to do something which is not available here, do we have to do it in the data itself and create a column there? And so in terms of non-aggregate, I can show you an example. For example, now it's showing profit by region, which is aggregated into sum. But you mentioned you don't want aggregate, so you deselect. You go to analysis and deselect the aggregate measure. It's, it's going to show your distribution, and you can do things like um, box plot or stuff like that. But can we do any complex aggregation, like not aggregation basically, mm -hmm. complex uh, calculation, which I want to do on certain basis, like if this row is this, then add it to right. And so actually, the profit ratio is our calculation. 
So to differentiate a calculation with a normal field existing the data source, you look for the equal sign in front of it. So in this case, you saw equal sign, you know it's uh, calculated. Uh, you click edit, you can see the formula. So in this case, profit ratio is the division of profit and sales. Sorry, can you show it? Uh, sorry. So you can right click a field, click edit. So how do you create a new Oh, it's just as easy. For example, we want to disregard this. We want to say, uh, we want to create a calculated field which is like double the profit. So you just created a very simple calculated field. Can you use the finance also there? Uh, you mean conditions? Conditions. Actually, need to aggregate it or mm. make it as zero according to the conditions. Uh, yes, you can say let's say if profit is uh, less than zero, show one. If it's more than zero, show minus one. You can definitely do things like that. Yeah. So all the all the fields have to come from one table, or you can actually say table one, column one, or table two, column two. Oh, that's a really great question. You can actually aggregate different tables, and you can do joins. Like if those two tables have the same field, you can join them together. Okay. And then you can do table one. Yes, and then you can pull in all the fields from table one and table two. What do you think is the uh, most limiting limitation for tabular? Um, I, I, I think in business setting. Most cases, Tableau works really well, unless you want to create very customized, like the US gun desk, that kind of chart, which is like more um, advanced than this. But for basic chart type that people use in the business or even academic field, maybe tree map, a bar chart, a line chart is most common chart type I saw in business setting. So I guess it's okay in that area, but there are multiple tools on the market, like click view, macro strategy, each has its own pros and cons. Okay. It really depends on the use case. So let's say I have plotted a chart like this, right? Yep. And then next month, my base data change, I will have some new data. Because right. I'm not going to change it because I'm going to have to change it again. Then how do you manage it? And so you can do a simple refresh. It depends on your connection. So if, it's, if you are connecting it to our Excel, and your Excel upda got updated, you probably need to just uh, right click refresh, which is really fast as well. If you are connecting to a live database, then chances are you don't need to do anything because you will you refresh yourself. Refresh yeah, you can you also schedule it to refresh daily. Yes. Uh, so let me show you this. Basically, you can connect to different kind of data source. Excel is one of the options. Uh, and Excel is kind of static. So Excel, CSV, text file, those are kind of static data source. You can also connect to Surfer, which are more like dynamic data source because they will refresh themselves. You can also connect to stuff like Google BigQuery, all those like um, more advanced data source as well. Can you show us how the tables are related and where exactly you relate the tables, or join the tables? Uh, this one, let me see. Um, this one I don't really have example, but um, you can try with two data source with a shared field, for example, name, age, and name, job title. When you plug in, like when you input these two data source, um, basically you will show like two circles here with an overlapping kind of area, and you can basically select that to confirm that I want to join these two source, and you will put in both data table. Sorry, um, I'm going to understand um, for the dashboard, do you actually need, for example, for the user of the management needs to view the dashboard 
in order to view the dashboard, or can we actually export it and put it into PowerPoint? Okay, so the question is when you build a Tableau, does the management or your consumer need to install the software as well? So I think this is more like a question answered by Tableau sales, uh, but I can touch on that. Basically, you can publish your Tableau to Tableau server, and then basically use uh, web-based. So anyone who has the login to that website will be able to access without installing software. And this one is uh, paid uh, subscription, or is it a free? Uh, it's not free. Which is why in the next session we'll talk, we will talk about R, which is open source and free and great. To save those files, I think require the paid version of Tableau Professional. Yeah. And actually, there is such a they, now they have a Tableau Reader where unpaid um, it's the unpaid version where you can only read the files on Tableau Readers. So can this be exported and then the, can the dashboard be exported and? Uh, so the question is, can dashboard can ex be exploited uh, in a dash in a PowerPoint? It can be exported in any PDF for sure. <coughs> Let's see. Um, I do recall it can be exported in PDF. Maybe you can screenshot and put it in a PowerPoint. <laughs> software in order to embed your interactive block into the PPT. Yeah, so like uh, yeah, that's true. That some like software called uh, Live Slides. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Those you can actually, I mean, you need another one to embed it. Yeah, unless you make a GIF of it and then plug it into like Google Slides or something. Uh, so just for that question, I think uh, it's quite concerned when we use Tableau as a, you know, like, uh, data visualization because end of the day, right, like for us, we, we do a lot of data analysis. We want to show our, like, um, the visualization to the consumers, right? So uh, my concern is, because, you know, I'm working in the public health, right, most of the time the data is confidential. Mm -hmm. Like how, like, for example, if I do, like, something like this, right, but I want to keep my original data, you know, confidential, right. then, Perhaps the only thing I can show is the aggregated data. Is it possible? Because there are like two saves, right? One save the graph with data, the other one is, is only save the, the graph or something? Mm, that's a good question. So if your data is confidential, can you prevent people from seeing the data? I think it's a possibility. So. Uh, one thing is you can restrict the access of people who can use your dashboard. So you can give it the access to only limited people. Another thing is you can prevent people from downloading the workbook. So once people, because once people down, can download the workbook, they can actually unpack the data. So if you prevent them from downloading the workbook, you could basically give them only the view access, then you prevent them from seeing the underlying data. Okay. So for the two safe mode, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about the second one? Is it with aggregated data or the original data? Um, I would only, um, so this is only when you want to pass workbook around. Uh, most often you just publish it to the server, which is easier to share. Because when you pass around the workbook, actually people need to install reader, which is like a hassle for them. And But if you do need to share the workbook, I recommend the TWBX, which packaging the data. Otherwise, they, sometimes they cannot open. Oh, okay, so even you see that the second, the, the TWB, right? Yeah. Still not work. Uh, it doesn't work well. Okay. Any further questions? Okay. And um, so, anyone? I saw some people have brought laptop. Do we want to do the tap R demo? Anyone wants to do the hands-on session in R? if you have the R open and with the like uh, notebook installed and everything.
Okay, let's get started. So the demo we are uh, doing now uh, is based on one of the building data set called diamonds. It basically contains like so 4C or 5C of diamonds. And um, so in order to view the data set, first you need to load it. So you can run this snippet. To run it, you can click the little green button here. And basically it's running. Uh, what it did is it loaded the data set. So in this um, area, you can now see your data set. And when you click on it, a pop up window, which gives you like a view of what's in there. C 
similar to clicking on the data field, you can also run this head data set, which basically shows you the first six rows of the data. Is it always six because I've seen like head and tail always? Yeah, head and tail is always six, but you can do things like ten, and then it will show you ten. And another very nifty function, which is summary statistics, is you will show you kind of the mean, max, quartile of each field. So this is where things get interesting. Um, we are using the ggplot library, and basically ggplot stands for Grammar of Graphics. It's one of the most used graphic library in R, one of the most used library in R as well. Um, it has a fixed set of syntax, and you can use it to do very dynamic visualization. So here we can build a histogram. So this is a histogram of price. Basically, the encoding you pass through is you want to visualize the price variable. And for your histogram, you want to have a bin width of like $200, I guess. You can vary the bin width from 200 to 500. And then you can actually color it by clarity. So now it gives you a stacked column. Yeah. You loaded the diamond data set. Right. Um, so, like, when you run the oh, okay. So, when you're running GDPR, you have to provide what data set you want. So right. So, the two data sets you just. Yes, <coughs> that's correct. I'm sorry. What is the difference between GDPR and GDPR? Like, it was existing and then. Ah. Uh. Uh, it's the same. ggplot2 is a library's name. The syntax is actually calling ggplot. So it's the oh, same. It like I, no, there's no version 1, version 2. So it's one version ggplot2. <coughs> so instead of viewing it by a stacked column, you can turn it into a small multiples. So if you're still following, what happens here is I didn't pass the color variable. I didn't pa um, pass it a color variable clarity. I use clarity to break it out into like multiple rows. So this function is called a facet grid. And basically, you put it on the left, it will show us rows. If you put it on the right, we will show it as columns. not clear at all. Let's stick to the row. Any problem so far? Uh, so if you don't follow, you can just watch along and um, play with it at home or something. And the next, instead of a histogram, we can do a point, like a scatter point. So the default is like black. <laughs> and what you pass into this graphic is you are saying x equal to carrot, y equal to press. So it's like a press versus carrot scatter plot. And then we can add in some colors. Again, we color by clarity. So this is what gives you. It also comes with a little legend to help you identify which color means which clarity. Um, if we go back for this one, the I1, right, is there a way to switch the order? This one? Seventy-three. Nine fifty-three. Nine fifty-three. This one? Uh, yes. Uh, you can switch the order of the clarity by releveling the factor, which is a little complex here. But it, if you Google releveling the factor, it will show you how to put in some um, sequence into this clarity field, and then after then you pass in the clarity, you will show the order you want. So right now, what is the default sequence? This, the I think they. Yeah, I think so. Mm. 
and we can try a little bit of coding ourselves instead of color by clarity that we can try coloring by card oh, so card is like really fairly distributed is everywhere so just now when we saw the clarity, there's a lot of overlapping. One way to deal with that is we can introduce alpha, which is transparency. Or we can make the size a bit smaller. So in this case, we make the door smaller, which is slightly clearer in some world sense. If you want to change the color, Mm. Yeah, the color is this default rainbow palette, but you can you use your either you can use your own palette or there's like multiple libraries of palette. One is called Viridis, which is so called scientifically proven for people to like sequence the color in like even sequence. Some people say rainbow is not great because people don't perceive each color as equal. Something like that. And then you can change the size by cut. Basically, we're exploring. It's, our fi it's fairly cluttered here. We can also add in transparency. So we have this scatter plot. One thing we can do is we can fit our linear regression line. So you're adding a line on our black background because we didn't pass in any color or anything like that. Sorry, um, the, the plot for the regression, right? Yeah. What is alpha? Uh, so alpha is here, 997. Yeah. So alpha is uh, so what is alpha? Alpha is the transparency. When alpha is zero, is like almost no color. When alpha is one, is the original color. We can try a really low value. You'll be very very faint. Yeah, because there's so many data points here. It's still showing very strongly. And then instead of our straight line, we can show our smooth line, basically by, by passing geo smooth. So in this case, um, <coughs> we feed one smooth line to the entire data set, but maybe we want to feed multiple smooth curves to maybe multiple cut. In this example, we can cut by clarity. So in this case, it's um, fitting one line each to each clarity. And the color is also aligning with the color, color with the clarity legend. What is SE? SE is standard error. So if you don't do SE equal to false, it will show a band of, of confidence interval. So this is what happens if you don't say SE equal to false. Because the default is SE equal to true, it will show a band. And the band corresponds to the band should be the confidence interval, if I'm not wrong. Is it 90%, And uh, should be 95 percent. You can check that out <coughs> further. So here we feed multiple lines. We can do something more adventurous. We can color it, but only feed one line. So we can have both. So in this case, we colored it, but then we didn't color the smooth curve. What's happened here is basically we're passing a group equal to one to tell this um, ggplot to show only one regression or fit the smooth line. Okay, so if you compare these graphics, uh, which we don't have group equal to one, with this, which we have group equal to one, so when we don't group it, you will f and we are coloring it by clarity, 
um, basically will feed a smooth line to each clarity bucket. Where it's 1 equals to 1, just ignores the clarity. That's right. When group is equal to one, it ignores the card you put in. You basically feed a smooth curve to the entire data set. And just now we showed facet, uh, facet grid, which is like either go by row or column. And here we can show facet wrap, which is give you like a small multiple x by y. We can have multiple rows and multiple columns. And then here we are seeing this gray background everywhere. Maybe we want to apply a more minimalistic theme. So one thing we add is we add this theme minimal. Um, where I added this parameter theme minimal. Uh, so you will show uh, like a white with faint gray grid. So that's a section on scatter plot. Next one, we can do a box plot. So the difference is instead of passing geo point, geo is kind of the aesthetical parameters, we pass in geo box plot. So it's very simple and it looks decent. It shows you the distribution of price by color. One, vari one vari vari variation of box plot is like violin plot, which looks a bit funky. Looks like this. <coughs> and same to what we did to the scatter point, we can also do a small multiple of the box plot. Basically here we are dividing it by card. So each small chart is about a particular card, whether it's a fairly good card or it's a premium card. So we're almost towards the end. And just to as a brief review, we did histogram, we did box plot, we did scatter plot. We also turn them into small multiples, either by row, by column, or by both. And we we're just missing a little something. We can add a title. So in the last uh, example, we will add a GG title. And you can basically add any title you want. So that's basically it. It's not super difficult. You just need to understand where to put for each syntax and what to put for each visual encodings, whether it's like X variable, Y variable, is it color, size, alpha, transparency, or um, the small multiple you want to show the graphics by. Okay. Uh, which row it is? One four three. Uh, okay. So zero point eight is it's showing a legend for the alpha, but maybe you don't want to show. You can actually hide this. Yeah, it's showing a transparency as well, but. Likely you don't want to show that. And then the, you know there is a, there's a line in the middle, right? Yeah. And then there is this box outside the line. Right. What does the box represent? Um, so uh, it's a standard box plot. It's showing um, like the upper quartile, lower quartile. Okay. So it's quartile. quartile. Yeah. So bottom 25, median, yeah. top 25. Yeah. Okay. And then the
So for the help part, when we try to actually uh, use the help to just see how the syntaxes are, yeah. the functions, mm -hmm. it's quite difficult to get the examples here. So sometimes it's also tricky to yeah. know what exactly they are trying to say. Like for example, now I understand why alpha is used or somewhere, but right. reading from the syntax is <coughs> quite difficult. Right. So are there like any files or where we can start on with these examples? Uh, yeah, so they have building help function here. Uh, there's also, with Google, you will be able to, you will actually be able to find a lot of R graphic example. There is also a website called R-graph-gallery, which basically gives you um, some um, fairly common chart type with the code. Yeah, there's a lot of documentation on chart. There's some many books on it as well. So I'm sure, pretty sure you'll be able to find All right, so that's for the demo session. Any further questions? Can we export the, the charts? Uh, sure. And um, so one thing you can do is you can save it. You can do something like PNG chart name dot PNG. Something like this, and then afterwards you will do device off to kind of shut off the graphic device. But an easier way to do is I just run it on the console instead of the notebook, and then you will give me an export button. Um, I think the notebook is like more interactive. It lets you code and see the results immediately at the same time. Console is like normal programming language, you will enter something into console and the chart pop up in a different chart window here. And, and every time I export, I can only export one chart, right? Uh, you can, if you need, you could export multiple charts as well. Like you can apply some function or even do a loop and then to export a series of chart. Yeah. Um, so your question is how to get the console? Are you on R Studio? Uh, yes. uh, so on R Studio, you should be able to have the console as one of your pane. Uh, so to run the code in the console is really simple. You just copy it, and then you should have a console area in some part of your screen. Depends on your own layout. For me, it's on the bottom left. So I just copy it, I paste it, and then press enter. It will show. Yeah. Is there any further questions? Cool, so really well done everyone for bringing your laptop, participating in this session. I hope you like visualization or enjoy the introduction of the basics of it. So that's it for this session.
Um, you can also fill in the feedback form, which is the shortened URL is www.code.workshop. If you'd like, there's a feedback form you can fill in. Oh, OK. So the feedback form is www.code.workshop. You can fill in to help us improve, maybe help me improve, and you see what kind of topic you like. Go young. Okay, thank you.